Uh, well, hello. Um, this, uh, this is our fourth session, and uh, today we're going to be talking about housing cooperatives. This is um, not really, for most people, a familiar um, form of property ownership, but as it happens in Chicago, there are far more um, housing cooperatives than most people realize. So it's a useful thing to know about. This presentation will not be as long as some of the others, but um, I think it's important to know about this if you're a Chicago real estate attorney. You may very well encounter um, a uh, housing cooperative in your practice, and who knows, you may end up setting uh, up a cooperative. So let's, we're going to talk about what they are, how they differ from condominiums, uh, the different kinds of legal forms that they can take, and um, in some of, the, some of the ways in which they can operate almost like a condominium but using different legal mechanisms. So uh, first, what are housing cooperatives? I don't know how many of you are at all familiar with them, but let's talk about what they are. First, uh, let's talk about what, it, what cooperatives are in general. What is a cooperative? A cooperative is a form of economic organization that is intentionally provided as an alternative to competitive uh, profit-making or capitalist um, businesses. Um, they may very well be corporations, most of them are corporations, but they're organized much uh, with, with a different purpose in mind. They are organized for a cooperation instead of competition. Um, the basic principle of a cooperative is that the control and the benefit of the undertaking, whatever kind of cooperative it is, whether it's housing or a business, that the, benef that the control and the benefit of the undertaking should be in the hands of the same people, that is, the users. The users of whatever service or products the, the co-op um, uh, provides. So there are no actual investors, there's no investor uh, class that, that is outside the, um, the, the enterprise and that owns it. There, the, um, the users of the service are the owners. So, for example, if you have a grocery store like Woodman's um, Grocery Store is up, uh, which you may have seen, I don't know, they're up across the, uh, the Wisconsin border up in Kenosha, it's Woodman's. It's a grocery store. It's organized as a cooperative. That means the employees, the people who do all the work that keep the cooperative going, the people checking out the groceries and stocking the shelves, etc., are the owners of the store. In the case of a housing cooperative, um, if you have a residential multifamily building, you, you know, the, the residents, the people who live in the building, the tenants, also own the building. So in essence, they are their own landlord. And that's the principle behind um, cooperation. You don't have a separate ownership class. It very much is an anti-capitalist uh, way of organizing things, but it is done within the context of a capitalist society using the, the mechanisms uh, of our legal system in, in a manner that, that, that functions in a perfectly appropriate manner. So let me give you some examples of cooperatives. Um, if we just take business cooperatives, uh, credit unions are cooperatives. Ace Hardware and True Value Hardware are cooperatives. REI, um, which is the you know, the camping, et cetera, uh, stores, uh, store chain that you see around the country, REI, that's a cooperative. Welch's Foods, Whole Foods, Land of Lakes Dairy, you may have seen Land of Lakes Butter in the store, Ocean Spray, the Cranberry Juice, these are all cooperatives. And there are many, many other cooperative, uh, business cooperatives um, in this country and elsewhere. And housing, well, you might be surprised to know there are an estimated 800 housing cooperatives in Chicago. And I, I just listed some of them from a web page that lists Chicago co-ops. And if you look at this, you'll see that some of these are quite small, you know, four units, 20 units, whatever. Others are very large, 600 units, 800 units, 90 units, 400 units, 168 units, 279 units. So, so these co-ops can be of all sizes. A lot of them are... Um, intended to be low income and limited equity cooperatives that are uh, brought into existence through various government uh, programs, either state or federal. 
uh, but others are simply, you know, market rate uh, sales of very luxurious buildings. There are buildings on the lakefront, the, the Lake Michigan lakefront, that are where the shares, the, the co-op shares sell for, um, you know, a million or more dollars. So there are all different kinds of co-ops. They can take different forms um, in different situations. They can be available for people of all different means and um, social classes. Um, the cooperative movement, and that, it is that, there, there is a cooperative movement. There has been a cooperative movement in existence since the mid-1800s, since before the Civil War. Um, it, is a, um, it is a movement that arose in, you might say, in reaction to industrial capitalism. If you remember your history books, you may remember that um, uh, in, in the Industrial Revolution, happened in the early years of the, or began in the early years of the 19th century, the early 1800s. And um, so industrial capitalism as we know it dates back to around the 1830s, 1840s. Well, um, and that's, that's when the cooperative movement began. It, it, of course, cooperative enterprises are as old as human civilization. People have gotten together and agreed to help each other um, provide for their common uh, defense and welfare for as long as there have been human beings in small groups. But um, what we call cooperatives today were organized in the context of a capitalist society, but organized in opposition to the abuses as they were perceived of industrial capitalism. And one of the most famous was the Rochdale Society. It was founded in 1844 as a consumer cooperative, and they, they generated some things called the Rochdale Principles. But those have been expanded over the years. And so let's talk about some of the principles of cooperation. These are very much the principles of a housing cooperative. And um, well, not all of them, but most of them. And um, that's important because we're, gonna, we're talking about condominium governance and HOA governance. And you need to understand that the principles and those principles are um, um, really arm's length uh, transactions and everyone is owns their own unit, etc. And what's interesting about this is that in condos and in HOAs, you're constantly hearing complaints that people are too out for themselves. They think that their home is their castle. They won't obey the rules. People are buying and selling, you know, doing whatever is in their best interest without caring what's best for the group. Well, housing cooperatives are different. They're not like that. And they operate according to different principles. So, as, so for example, democratic control uh, open membership based on commitment to the principles of cooperation. Now, open membership, yes. What they mean by that is membership is not prohibited to groups based on race or religion or age and so forth. However, people are denied entry to housing cooperatives if they do not subscribe to the principles um, with, a, with a condominium. And I'll touch on this again because it's very important. You know, condominium units are bought and sold individually through the real estate market, and often the uh, directors, normally directors, have no say in um, whether they come in or not. Uh, now, some condominiums have a right of first refusal, but they often really, in, in practice, they, they almost never exercise it. Whereas um, with, with co-ops, they don't have to buy the unit uh, if they don't like uh, a prospective uh, purchaser, they just say, no, you can't, you can't buy the unit. They interview people. And so the co-op has, the cooperatives have a lot of control over their membership, but it does open membership uh, with respect to all demographic groups. Uh, they are, um, some, many cooperatives have limited equity. In other words, there are actual limits either in contract or in statute on how much you can sell the units for or percentage, in, uh, percentage of, of uh, increased equity that is allowed. Um, that's to keep them affordable. This is for affordable uh, housing cooperatives and there are lots of those. Um, there is also a commitment to continuing membership education. Well, you know, condos, one of the problems, and we will be discussing this when we talk about financing, is that people buy into co-ops, I mean, and buy into condominiums, they don't have the slightest idea what they're getting into. They don't understand how the condo operates. They think they're buying a single family home. And that's usually not the case with the co-ops because they educate the members. They make sure that they educate the members. They make sure before they buy, they know what they're, that they're getting into a group living situation. 
Um, another principle is that cooperatives should, in essence, cooperate with each other. And at the end, I'll talk with you about the, briefly about the National Association of Housing Cooperatives. There are also other organizations that support cooperatives. There's also a real concern for community, community development in a co-op that, uh, that you rarely find in condos. You may remember that I mentioned the last session that in the uh, common interest development industry, there's more of an emphasis now on community development. Well, that's recent because they recognize the problems. The, the industry has begun to recognize that there is often no sense of community in a lot of uh, uh, so-called community associations. And so, you know, co-ops are really different. Again, they, they tend to have, a, um, a from, from day one, since they've been invented, they've had much more of a concern for community development. The uh, U.S. has a long history of cooperative formation. Uh, likewise, around the world, there's an international cooperative movement, as I mentioned, and there are just thousands and thousands of them around the world. Um, Chicago's housing cooperatives um, survived the crash of 0708 in much better financial condition than the vast majority of condo projects. Uh, people, the people who live, th this is probably because you don't find people living in housing cooperatives who view their unit as an investment that they should get rid of. Um, at this, when the market starts to turn down, or uh, you don't find investor owners. And so you don't get sudden reactions in co-ops where lots of people sell their units or there's a huge flood to buy them, uh, depending upon prices. Uh, they, are, they are populated by people um, who live and own the, in the cooperative, and they are more invested in it financially and emotionally and socially. And so they are less affected by ebbs and flows in, the, in real estate prices. It just doesn't matter as much to them. Now, remember we talked about how homeowner associations are creatures of common law and condominiums are creatures of statute, meaning HOAs have been around for hundreds, potentially for 150 plus years, uh, longer depending on how you define them, but they are created through um, common law, the law of restrictive covenants or equitable servitudes, as you may remember from property law. And so they don't need an enabling statute. Condominiums do. Condominiums uh, cannot be created unless the law permits them to be created. They are creatures of condominium property acts. And they are heavily regulated through those acts. Well, what about cooperatives? They are not creatures of common law. They are not creatures of statute. They are creatures of contract. Cooperatives are structured and governed and run according to their own contracts. There is not very much law uh, uh, statutory law on cooperatives. And so HOAs, common law. Condominiums, statute. Cooperatives, contract. Let's look at some of the definitions. Um, the Cook County Assessor's Office, the Internal Revenue Code, and my friend, famous cooperative attorney Herb Fisher, they say basically the same thing. Let's, let's look at them. Uh, the Assessor's Office would say it's residential property owned by a corporation whose sole asset is that real estate and which sells its shares to individual members who in turn become entitled to a long-term lease on specific uh, units. Similarly, the Internal Revenue Code, Section 216, how it defines cooperative housing corporation. A corporation with one class of stock with each stockholder member entitled to occupy a dwelling unit but not entitled to receive distributions, not out of earnings, except upon liquidation of the corporation. 80% or more of its income is derived from stockholders. We're talking about the, the, the payments on the rental leases. Um, initial stock issue is distributed to each stockholder bearing a reasonable relationship to the corporation's equity that is attributable to the dwelling unit each stockholder is entitled to occupy. And as Herb Fisher puts it, it's residential real estate with title in persons who have a right to occupy its residential units or with title in another entity owned by the persons who have a right to occupy its residential units pursuant to a set of agreed ownership and operational standards and covenants. So let's boil this down just a little bit. Um, we're talking about a situation in which if you were to buy a uh, co-op unit, you would, you would get two things. One would be a share of stock in the corporation that would entitle you 
to your the ability to vote in the elections and this sort of thing. Um, so you would be a part owner of the building and therefore you participate in the democratic control of the building. It doesn't have to be one building. I'm just saying it could be many buildings, but um, just for ease of, of explanation. And you also get a lease, which they call a proprietary lease, which is the exclusive right to occupy a particular residential unit in the building. So you get a share and you get a lease and you pay rent to the corporation but you also control the corporation through your uh, share of stock ownership. Now you can't sell the stock ownership without, as I said, without giving up your lease and you can't do that without the consent of the board. So let's talk now about how this can be structured because as it happens there are several different ways to organize a cooperative. You might discover um, in a given situation that, that a cooperative is organized in, in any one of these different ways. And it might enable you to identify it as a cooperative because sometimes it's not called a cooperative. But let's, let's look at how, that, how this is done. First, and this is the most common way to organize a housing co-op as a business corporation. Um, shares are issued that are in proportion to the value of the unit that is going to be occupied by a particular person. Um, they, that person has the right to occupy a dwelling unit that is owned by the corporation. So you got a share of corporation stock and you have a lease, a proprietary lease um, with self-renewing terms of years. It could be, for example, successive 99 year terms or it could be um, uh, basically without limit, but it's a lease. And so there's a, a share of stock in a business corporation a, that carries with it the right to occupy a unit pursuant to a proprietary lease. Um, second way to do it is with a not-for-profit corporation. If it's a not-for-profit corporation, then you get a membership certificate. It is not stock, it's a membership certificate. It has a set price, or it might have a, a price that can vary with more, uh, depending upon market considerations. You get the right to occupy again a corporate owned dwelling unit without additional consideration and a proprietary lease. Um, in some circumstances, if these are low, low income, um, FDA, uh, FHA, HUD, or uh, Illinois Housing Development Corporation finance low income co-ops, that it may have a three year occupancy agreement with automatic renewal. But there are other ways to do this. Another way is a land trust. In this case, you get a certificate that you have a percentage of ownership of beneficial interest in, uh, in a land trust. The land trust holds title of the property. Um, you get the right, again, the right to occupy the unit in a land trust owned property pursuant to a lease or an occupancy agreement. Now, another way is tenancy in common. Um, I don't know how many of these there are in Chicago, frankly. I do know they are, there are lots of them in some of the cities, particularly San Francisco. San Francisco is known for T and C's, as they call them. And the reason is because in San Francisco, there are some severe restrictions on condominium conversions, that is, converting apartments to condo buildings. And uh, it's very difficult to do. And so uh, often conversions of apartment buildings are, in fact, to tenancy in commons. But these are very much like and in essence, a type of housing cooperative. What do you get? You get a fee simple deed to a real estate, but remember you're a tenant in common of the, of the overall building or project. You also get the right to possession. These are contractual documents. They give you the right to possession. Um, if you are the fee, the deed owner, you get a right to possession of a particular unit which is explained in uh, and controlled by recorded covenants or unrecorded documents, usually they're recorded, that are binding um, on successive successor title holders. Now, if you just looked at the documents for a TNC, they typically look almost exactly like condo CCNRs. Um, in San Francisco, for example, there is one particular attorney who does almost all the TNCs very um, big business for him and uh, I, I've seen his documents and they look very very much like 
um, condominium CCNRs and the rules and regulations and the way things are described. They have passed uh, legal scrutiny numerous times. Now, remember what I'm saying. when In saying that co-ops are creatures of their own, uh, uh, of creatures of contract, you have to understand that there's a very little statutory framework here. And this with the TNCs, this is very much the case. And there's no, you know, uh, uh, Housing Cooperative Act. And so you need to be very familiar with the documents and understand that they are, the, they are it is the documents that describes the, uh, the rights of the parties. It's not the law. However, the good side of that is there's not much litigation in um, housing cooperatives. There's a lot of litigation over condominiums. There's a lot of litigation in HOAs. There's very little with respect to um, housing cooperatives. People just don't sue each other so often. They don't see the need. Um, and because of the nature of the, of the cooperation and the often limited equity, they're, they're, the stakes are very low. There's no point in it. Um, another way to do this is through a leasehold where the, the cooperative's asset is a leasehold interest in the property. In other words, the cooperative rents the property, leases the property from some other property owner, and then they sublease to the cooperative shareholders. So the corporation, if it's a cooperative, is a corporation that leases the property and then subleases it to the shareholders. Um, and I mentioned limited equity cooperatives. Um, this is a type of cooperative intended for low income people or moderate income people, where the documents, the contracts or the government regulations that are, are applied uh, under which it was financed or the, the construction loan was made limit the amount for which each interest can be sold by the shareholder or by the cooperative. Now I mentioned the term creatures of contract. So this is a quotation from Brad Zell versus Koretsky in a, a case involving co-ops. Whether the title is in a land trust or held by a corporation is merely a matter of convenience of the parties. The essence of the cooperative is the agreement among the co-owners. So these things are creatures of contract. Now um, let's go through a few of the legal provisions that, that make, that facilitate co-ownership. Um, first, the Illinois Not-for-Profit Corporation Act um, authorizes specifically not-for-profit corporations to have as their purpose the ownership or administration of residential property on a cooperative basis. So that is, there is, there is specific statutory authorization for that. Uh, and obviously a profit-making corporation can do that as well. Um, that, again, that's simple, you know, corporation law and contract law. Um, the Illinois, uh, the, excuse me, the Internal Revenue Code has certain sections that apply to um, co-ops. First, Section 216 says that the, the cooperative's real estate tax and mortgage interest expense pass through to the members uh, so they can take them as deductions on their personal tax returns. This is assuming that it qualifies the, under 216. That, that's the same section I cited earlier where 80% of the revenues, etc. As long as it qualifies, and the vast majority of them do, then the, 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 the tax, the real estate tax and mortgage interest expenses pass through. Um, also, Internal Revenue Code Section 1034F, if people sell the, when people are buying and selling co-op interests, this qualifies for non-recognition of capital gains in the same way it would with a single family home in fee simple ownership. Uh, also, um, the homeowner's exemption is available. The senior citizen homestead exemption is available. Uh, the association takes the, gets the same benefit from the city of Chicago scavenger refund ordinance, meaning if they're, not, if they're collecting their own trash, they get a, um, uh, a credit for that. Now, um, there, are others, there are some special considerations. Uh, first, the mortgage arrangement is, is a bit different. Um, so what you would expect to see is that um, the cooperative takes out a blanket mortgage on the whole building. Uh, and what the shareholders get is a member share loan to, to purchase the share. Um, not all banks do this, but some do. So it's a bit, 
the reason that there are certain attorneys that do this type of cooperative work is because they, among other things, not all banks do these, they make these uh, blanket mortgages, not all banks make share loans. They know where to steer people. Um, also, uh, this is important. The business judgment rule normally applies to the decisions of the corporate board of directors. Uh, this is important. We will be talking more about this later. And I mentioned it previously, and it, it requires further explanation. But um, the business judgment rule is a protection. It protects both the decisions that are made by a corporate board of directors from judicial review, and it also protects the directors themselves from being sued or from losing a lawsuit. So the business judgment rule or doctrine protects both the decision itself against being overturned and it protects the people who made the decision against personal liability. Well, this is an important thing because co-ops being, in most cases, business corporations can take, can, can take advantage of this. Also, as with um, HOAs and condos, uh, in this case, even with greater justification, I would say, the, um, the cooperative corporation can, can use eviction law. They can use forcible entry and detainer for collection of unpaid rent like any other landlord. Um, so, but as I said, there isn't a lot of statutory law that specifically applies to cooperatives, so they are creatures of their own contractual documents, their articles of incorporation, their bylaws, and the lease agreements. Um, a couple of differences and then maybe some of the similarities. Um, a condominium, in the condominium, remember that the association manages the property but does not own the property. The, the, uh, the unit owners own their, their um, airspace, but they also own an undivided interest, a percentage interest in the whole building. So the condo association doesn't own anything at all. Um, and the association uh, cannot prevent the sale of the property and the purchase of units by particular people. The co-op, the corporation owns the property and the association board of directors has a veto power over purchases of units. So this is critical, as I said earlier. Um, the the, the co-op has greater control over association membership and conduct. Um, a drug dealer can plunk down a million dollars and buy an expensive condo unit. He, this pr drug dealer will not be able to buy the co-op unit. If they find out that he's probably a drug dealer, he won't be able to buy anything. Um, there is less conflict over rules because people uh, have accepted the rules and or had them explained to them or they can't get into the, they can't buy. So you don't get this, my home is my castle attitude. Uh, and also no investor owners and no and normally no subleasing of units. So the building is full of people who own it and who live there. It's their residence, it's their, um, it's their home, it's their community. Um, as I said, you get parallel functions available for co-ops. Tax treatment is, the, is similar. Um, the title, there are ways to get the same kind of basically title insurance uh, that your interest is secure. Uh, mortgages, I uh, explained that they, there's a parallel structure here. Um, funding of the association is basically the same. I mean, they're, they're collecting rents instead of assessments, but it's the same principle. Um, governance, business judgment rule applies. But the problem is that these arrangements are not as institutionalized in statute and in professional practices as they are with condominiums. They're not, um, because there are fewer um, cooperatives and because they aren't as powerful politically as the, the real estate developers and the uh, industry that supports condos, the, um, you know, they're not as institutionalized. And so it, it's, a more, um, it's less familiar to the public. However, there are several organizations that assist cooperatives and make life easier for you. Um, these are some of them, the Chicago Community Loan Fund, the uh, National Association of Housing Cooperatives, National Cooperative Bank, the National Cooperative Business Association, etc. And um, this is, um, this is the, there's, a, you might say, a sort of network of um, pro-cooperative organizations. The um, National Association of Housing Cooperatives at coophousing.org. Um, here's, a, here's a little um, brief description from their website. They represent housing co-ops, et cetera, and other resident-owned or controlled housing, and also the people who work with them. Um, I mentioned Herb Fisher. There are other lawyers who work with them. 
they've been around a long time um, and they are the principal organization that does this. They have a national board of directors. They have annual meetings. I think this year's meeting is in Texas. They have, uh, as according to their numbers, more than a million uh, families living in housing cooperatives at, um, in this country. And so um, this is, um, uh, these, these resources are available and people getting into this line of practice may wanna uh, encourage their clients to take advantage of that. So let's uh, summarize this. Uh, in, in brief, uh, it is a fact based upon what people in the field have seen over time that cooperatives are a very durable form of home ownership for people of low or moderate income. It allows basically home ownership for people who might not be able to afford a, a market price condominium because of, they can get into a limited equity co-op. Um, and they are very durable in the sense that they are um, they're resilient. They, they survive economic downturns and fluctuations in housing prices m much better than condominiums. There is less conflict and litigation, far less conflict and litigation in co-ops than there is in condos, which are really hotbeds often of litigation. Uh, however, despite all that, only a tiny percentage of new housing is in cooperatives. And we have quite a few in, in Chicago, um, but not around the country in the many other cities. And so um, I see I have an incomplete sentence here. Because there are about 800 of them in Chicago, it is a very useful thing for you to know about. And I would encourage you to keep it in mind. Even though you see co uh, condominiums popping up all around and, and no new or few new co-ops, um, it's still a very important type of housing to know about as a Chicago real estate attorney because it's entirely possible that you will, you will encounter this, this form of housing uh, in your practice. So you may want to keep it in mind. And with that, we'll close uh, today's presentation.